episode of Shady Journey Constructed News, a show where a couple of guys in a couple of countries have a couple of beers and discuss a stadium somewhere in the world and their experiences there. I'm Paul. And I'm Dave. And we're excited to be with you here tonight. Before we get started, please make sure to subscribe to the Stadium Journey YouTube channel, like the video, and leave a comment if you feel so inclined. Check out stadiumjourney.com for all of our fantastic comment content. Let's get rolling. Dave, what are you drinking today? So today uh, I have a remnant still of my uh, my advent calendar of, of 2022. So my sister-in-law bought me a, a beer advent calendar. I'm still so jealous of that present. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, I, but I can't drink that much. <laughs> so anyway, it was from uh, Brock Street Brewery in uh, Whitby, and I have the light lime lager which you know kind of reminds you of uh, a corona you put the lime in the corona or um maybe you cheat and you have one of those bud light limes which apparently exists but i refuse to drink uh so anyway this is uh for for a a lime beer very it's very tart very very kind of fresh a lot lighter than i expected it to be so uh yeah, it's it's a, a pleasant surprise, and uh, I'm enjoying it so far. What do you got? Nice. Uh, so I have got a uh, beer made out on Cape Cod, and uh, I don't know if you've ever walked along a beach living up in Canada. I know you have beaches up there, but... We have beaches, you ever, yes. You ever, you ever Wasaga well, Beach, the longest freshwater beach in the world. All right, so you're not going to find a devil's purse on a, on a freshwater beach in Wasaga. Ontario. So a devil's purse is uh some kind of animal. I'm I'm blanking on it right now. I think it's like a like when a jellyfish dies or something. They leave behind or it's an egg. It's an egg sack is what it is. And it looks like I don't know, it's like this kind of looks rubbery and it's got these little strings coming off of it. It's called a devil's purse. So I've got a beer from a brewery called Devil's Purse Brewery. Makes sense if you're on Cape Cod where there's a lot of water, a lot of beaches. You're gonna walk down a beach and you're gonna see a devil's purse. Actually, it's in the logo. If I can show it, there it is. It looks like that. Um, it's actually it's an egg sack for some kind of marine egg animal. sack beer. Egg sack beer would not be as appetizing as <laughs> even I, I don't think Devil's Purse Brewing is a great name for a brewery. Anyway. <laughs> but anyway, I've got what the hand line Colch, which is actually pretty smooth, as you can tell as we're recording this. It's very smooth because it's almost gone already. <laughs> <laughs> so from South Dennis, Mass. Devil's Purse Brewing, Handline Cold. If we're visiting today's destination, we might be drinking a Be More Hazy from Oliver Brewing Company in Baltimore, Maryland. Be More, Baltimore. See, look at that. Because today we're talking about M&T Bank Stadium, home of the Baltimore Ravens. Before we dive in, let's take a look at the stadium vitals. <laughs> Hey, so for our discussion on M&T Bank Stadium, we are joined today by our good friend, Stadium Journey correspondent, Richard Smith. Richard, thanks for joining us to talk about the Ravens experience. Thank you. So, uh, so Richard, M&T Bank Stadium is uh, shares kind of a neighborhood with uh, Camden Yards, the Orioles Stadium, but it really doesn't receive the love and the accolades that Camden Yards receives, but yet it's really a fantastic place to catch a football game. Yeah, and honestly, I think that, you know, recently I've been going to lots of NFL stadiums. Just last night I was actually at MetLife Stadium. I've been to State Farm Stadium, the NFL London game at Tottenham, which honestly is an NFL stadium. Some of those, you know, Allegiant also, uh, SoFi, they get lots of press for being just super pretty and cool. And this is not me being a homer, but I'm actually think that M and T ranks right up there with the experience. Um, it fits in so well with the city that it's in, and I think that makes a perfect experience. Not perfect, you know what I mean. I've gotten in trouble for that before. <laughs> no comment there. And uh, we're actually this is actually a very timely discussion we're having about the Raven Stadium, which was actually known as Raven Stadium for a while. Because we're we're recording this in uh, mid December 2023, and just today there was there was a big announcement regarding some renovations that are happening to the stadium. 
And some of it, um, I will preface it, some of it is actually not as popular as it sounds, and I'll, I'll explain that in a second. The Ravens are spending lots of money now. Lots of it is state money that they're um, through the Maryland Stadium Authority, which is a sort of a quasi-state agency that funds lots of this through bonds. Um, them and the Ravens tend to spend a lot of money, unlike uh, maybe the other team in town um, next door who still hasn't agreed upon a lease. And who knows when this gets uh, released, it still may not be agreed upon by a lease. The Ravens don't do that. They spend money. So even if it's state money or a combination, they're spending it. So they just announced what they call the next evolution of M&T Bank Stadium. Um, lots of it is, frankly, there's going to be a lots of it that's for the high money people. There's lots of new clubs. Um, they're taking away some of uh, season ticket holders in lower end zones that are going to be clubs. They're going to move to other places. So some of that is not perfect. But they're also spending lots of money on the North Plaza. Uh, which is sort of the the, the gateway towards uh, the city and back towards Oriole Park. Um, they're going to build a couple new structures there with beer halls and things like that that you can go to before a game without even a ticket. Um, they're doing a lot more work on the upper concourse. And I think my opinion with the Ravens and the Maryland Stadium Authority is that they've done a good job over the years to take a stadium that is now nearly 30 years old and it does not feel old. It is only one year difference in age from uh, FedEx Field just down the road. If you go to FedEx Field, that stadium feels like it's 70 years old and it's about ready to fall down. It probably is. You go to M&T Bank Stadium, it is just up there with all those nice new ones. In, indeed it is. Uh, for Mike, I, I haven't been to a Ravens home game since uh, 2007, but I had been to three. See, I go as far back as a Baltimore football fan and I saw as many games in Memorial Stadium as I've seen at Ravian Stadium. So uh but you know the the Browns the Colts did the did the city dirty because I think at heart I think Baltimore is a football city. It is. I really do. More so than it is a baseball city. So when the Colts left and moving down to Baltimore right after that happened, there was such a hole in that city for a long time. And the Ravens have just done a wonderful job of filling that hole and taking their place right in the city's fabric. And I didn't move to Baltimore until after the Colts were out of town. Um, and I don't know for the longest time if I knew that it was a football town because there was no football team. The way I originally saw it was when the Canadian Football League moved their team. Or oh, added yeah, the Stallions. Baltimore. Yes. And the Stallions were, well, first of all, they were not the Stallions at first. They were the, C, the CFL Colts until the NFL put the little uh, the bill on top of yeah. <laughs> Then they were the Baltimore Football Club briefly. Then they became the Stallions. And in the two years that they were in town, they filled up Memorial Stadium. And honestly, frankly, they pretty much dominated um, the, the CFL, going to the Great Cup the first year, winning the Great Cup the second year. So... That's when I realized Baltimore was a football town. And so when the Ravens moved in, got that new stadium, uh, which was Raven Stadium is also PSI net for a while, a failed internet uh, upstart. That's when I realized, wow, this town does care about football. Baseball is great. Football is what this town wants. Absolutely. And people probably, would, if you're not from the area, you probably wouldn't realize that because the Ravens just aren't storied like the Orioles are. So we were talking about improvements to the uh, – the north side of the stadium and that's that's really where most if you're coming to visit for a Ravens game you're probably coming in that way you're coming from the downtown you're walking down uh, Utah Street behind Camden Yards and down what they used to call I don't know if they still call it Ravens Walk they do which even back in the day before they really uh, they were planning to build it up before that was really a great plaza and a great introduction to a Baltimore football game yeah and um I grew up um with Big 10 football I lived right at the university near the University of Illinois, and I was used to really good uh, tailgating activities. The first time I went to a Ravens game, walk down Ravens Walk, I was like, wow, I thought I knew great tailgating. This is tailgating to some levels I've never seen before. Um, and that Ravens Walk area is still really, I was just there a few weeks ago. That is a, a fun thing. You watch the Ravens marching band. Yes. which people don't know is the old Baltimore Colts marching band. Yep. They actually hid their 
uniforms and uh, percussion instruments and things like that away from the Colts so the Colts wouldn't take it to Indianapolis. Ah, oh, that's a great story. <laughs> that's a story band. They walk down that Ravens walk before the game. It's, I mean, it's it's part, it, it reminds me of like being in New Orleans with a parade coming down the street. Um, it's a pretty crazy thing. Now, I do want to mention that part of this new thing that the Ravens are going to do is they're trying to sort of beef up the experience of coming from other directions as well. And one of the things that you probably did not experience since it has been since 2007 is south of the stadium, uh, a few the years casino? ago. They, huh? The casino? Yeah, so they did open a horseshoe casino, and that really hasn't changed things much, except it's a, it provides another parking place for people. But they're trying to sort of create like an entertainment complex between the casino and the stadium. Right now, there's already um, a top golf that's opened. Uh, there's a sort of delayed uh, concert venue that's supposed to be opened uh, and a few other bars and restaurants. And I think that eventually the Ravens would like to see that it's Ravens Walk 1 and maybe Ravens Walk 2, essentially. Um, and I think that could even enhance it even more. Now, if they name that new concert venue Hammerjacks, then they have done everything right. And anyone who's a Baltimore person will understand that the famous concert venue Hammerjacks was located right where, well, the probably the probably the parking lot area of yeah, uh, m &T. Yeah. Um, They actually did try to open a hammer jacks a couple years ago, right, right nearby, and it sort of failed a bit. So. Yeah, yeah, going to college, I went to Johns Hopkins back in the mid-'80s. So uh, one of the first things they told us in orientation is, don't go downtown, don't go to that area, don't go to hammer jacks. So you know where I spent a lot of time during college. And it was but, a massive concert venue. It was many thousands of people jammed into an old factory building, essentially. Yeah. Great for those old 80s hair metal bands. But anyway, uh, so you you come down Raven's Walk, you go past the statues of Johnny Unitas and Ray Lewis, you go into the stadium, and all I can remember about the inside of that stadium is purple. Purple and black. And, and purple obviously is going to dominate black. It's a little boring if you just go with that. But there's purple every place. And honestly, now with technology, it's actually gone even more. You'll have much more purple lighting, LEDs, uh, lots more screens. Um, they The Ravens jump into that purple motif like no one, nobody's business. <laughs> uh, purple is really an underrated uniform color, I think. I think more teams should utilize it. In the NFL, I think there's two purple teams. There's two purple teams. And there's not many in other sports. The Rockies, right? the Colorado Rockies are purple. Can't think of many other pro teams that embrace the purple. I don't know of any, if I could think of any. Uh, yeah. I guess the Lakers. We're not going to talk about the Lakers. Yeah, well, let's not. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and, and it's a just it's a great, like you mentioned, the uh, the uh, band, which is really like a touch of college in the pro game. Not, not a lot of pro teams have a band anymore. And the Ravens jump in everything. They have the band. They have a really good cheerleaders. They have the male cheerleaders. So it's, you know, hey, it's, it's good for everyone. Um, they... Had at one point, and this is a really interesting story that came out last year, is they originally had three mascots. They yes. had Edgar Allen. Edgar Allen and Poe, because Edgar Allen Poe was from Baltimore. Well, he wasn't from Baltimore, but he did sort of die here. So, um, yeah. uh, so well, at least he spent, like, his end of his life. Yes. So Edgar Allen sort of disappeared after a while, and Poe became the main mascot. So last year, during a preseason game, one of those, one of those, where the kids play with the mascot on the field, like a football game. The person who did Poe actually broke his leg, so they broke this into one of the storylines that Poe is on the injured reserve list. They actually put out an injured reserve uh, notification and said, "We're going to have to try to see if we can find his brothers." Well, they find the old uniforms, I guess, for Edgar and Allen, and they they actually film a whole thing about them signing Edgar and Allen. And Edgar and Allen come out to the crowd, and they are just cheered like no one. I mean, it was great. And then at the very end of the season, guess who makes an appearance? Poe makes an appearance. Poe makes it back. Huh? Aaron Rodgers. Join, join his brothers. And it's just, it, it's one of those things that it doesn't make sense, but you go there and you're cheering, going, yay, Edgar, Allen, and Poe. And it's just, <laughs> whatever. Oh, it's awesome. such a Baltimore thing. It really is. Absolutely. Um, you wanted to mention some some uh, part of where stadium journey. So not only do we talk about the stadiums, 
we talk about the journey. So a big part of what we talk about in neighborhoods, how, how it is getting to that. You said there's a big news regarding getting to Raven Stadium. Yes, and this just literally happened when we're recording this uh, about actually three days before the last home game. Uh, the Baltimore light rail system, which is run by the state, it's not actually run by the city, runs from way north of Baltimore all the way down to Baltimore, Washington International Airport. Well, Thursday night, they make a rapid announcement, last minute announcement saying the light rail is shutting down for, oh, no. for whatever amount of time. And you find out it's a, there's some kind of electrical issue with the trains. So... Okay, so first of all, it's a problem with the the, or the Ravens game that's going to be in three days because lots of fans come there. Right. Now, obviously, this is not this is a sports podcast, but we also have to worry about suddenly there's all these people that need to get to work the next day who can't get to work because the light rail shut down. I live so in Rhode Island, Richard. This, you don't have to talk to me about that. <laughs> <laughs> and as of that now, like a few days after that, that light rail is still shut down. It's going to be shut down. It could be weeks, I think. Ooh. So... If you are attending a Ravens game, it is one more thing you have to consider for access because that's that's a where lots of people get to the game. I tell you, super convenient. If you're going into BWI, you hop on the light rail and boom, you're downtown Baltimore in, in under an hour. It is. Oh, it's under probably 20 minutes. Honestly. Yeah, it's, it's just fantastic. Um, so let's talk about the area around um, around the stadium because you know. Baltimore is one of those cities, and and uh, Dave and I have talked on the podcast a lot about those sneaky cities, sneaky fun cities. And I don't say this just because I lived in the city for four years, but Baltimore is really an underrated city as far as coming to visit. There is lots to do, and a lot of it's right near the stadium. Yeah, and um, right near the stadium is obviously the the inner harbor of Baltimore, which is not as shiny happy as it was back in the 80s there there's some talk of some redevelopment and things like that but it's still a gorgeous place to spend some time before or after the game lots of great bars and restaurants um some of the other neighborhoods like federal hills literally like a stone's throw away from the from m and t and i bet you've in, been there quite a bit. if you're in federal hill go to to the abbey burger bistro man great great place it is it is amazing um, and if you're in the suburbs of Baltimore, you can go up to Havard Grace, Maryland, and there's another Abbey Burger Bristro there. So if you want to not venture into the city, there is one that's there. Um, and they have actually a really good burger there that Adam Jones, former Oriole, um, is one of his favorites. Uh, check that on the menu. It's awesome. So, But just literally, there's lots of great things. Now, it is a there is crime in the city. You can't gloss that over at all. It's not one of the safest cities in the world. It's not. Um, but like any urban environment, I don't care if I'm in the so-called safest city in the world. I'm going to be careful. In Baltimore, yeah, be very careful. There's some places that don't just wander around aimlessly, <laughs> know where you're going. Don't just take your camera out and just be like, la, 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 la. No, it, it's not that kind of city. It is an urban environment. But don't be scared of Baltimore. Baltimore is, it, like you said, it's sneaky on that. It's a city of lots of neighborhoods and lots of quirky, cool neighborhoods. Yes, absolutely. Oh, uh, yeah. I lived up in Charles Village, which you wouldn't walk to from the stadium, but Charles Village is one of those you could walk around and be safe and lots of stuff to do. And yeah, within walking distance of the stadium, you said there's the casino there, there's the Inner Harbor. I would tell people walk past the Inner Harbor, go to Little Italy, right on the other side of the Little, right on right on the other side of the Inner Harbor. That's where you're going to hit, get your money worth. And Little Italy is a wonderful neighborhood. And then if you are still one of those persons who would like more like high-end shopping and restaurants, there's the Harbor East neighborhood, which is right by Little Italy. That probably is right now the better area for those kind of things than the Inner Harbor. Uh, it will be interesting in a few years to see how that neighborhood sort of refreshes itself. And it sounds like it probably will do that. So, yeah, lots to do. Uh, so if you're going down to Baltimore, geez, plenty of plenty of great food options. Plenty of great, uh, you got Fort McHenry right there. If you're looking to make like a whole Sunday or a whole weekend, uh, geez, what else? If you, if the timing's right, you know, you might hit the Orioles, which is, <laughs> which would be perfect timing. So uh, there's Boston. even a new neighborhood in Baltimore. That's sort of a manufactured neighborhood. Uh, it's called Baltimore Peninsula that, uh, is being developed by Under Armour because Under Armour is located headquartered in Baltimore. Um, and Sagamar Distillery, 
which is owned by the owner uh, or the main pre guy, Kevin Plank from Under Armour. That is a wonderful distillery. And if you're a fan of whiskeys, the Sagamore Rye is just, it's it's wonderful. So it sounds like, uh, yeah, and with the Ravens on a roll right now, as of we're rec our recording, they're in the number one seed in the AFC. So uh, we could be looking at long playoff runs. And those Baltimore fans are diehard. They're loud. They're enthusiastic. You would have a ton of fun visiting downtown Baltimore. Yep, I agree. All right, so that's our look at M&T Bank Stadium and the Baltimore Ravens game day experience. Hope you enjoyed it. And hope uh, thanks, Richard, for coming and joining us as a pinch hitter. And uh, we hope to see you all on the road again real soon. Cheers. Thank you.